In multiple regression, there's two different types of inference. There's the F test for the overall model, and then there are T tests that are used for the individual predictors. And here we're going to look at an example where we're trying to predict the total U.S. revenue of a movie um, based on three different explanatory variables. Its production budget, its opening weekend revenue, and the number of theaters where it played on opening weekend. And we're building this model based on a sample of 43 movies. So the null hypothesis is written in terms of the slopes, right? And we have multiple slopes because we have multiple explanatory variables here. And the null will always just be that B, beta 1 through beta k, however many you have, are all equal to 0. So in this case, you could change it to beta 3 because we only have three explanatory variables. And the null being equal to 0 um, is another way of saying that none of the variables are useful. Right, because if the slope is equal to zero for a particular variable, um, that means it doesn't matter what you plug in for that variable, it's not going to affect your prediction. So that variable would not be useful if its slope is equal to zero. And I am going to put a note here, um, don't include beta zero when you write your hypothesis like this, um, because beta zero is the intercept, and we're not necessarily saying that the intercept is equal to zero. Just like with chi-squared, where the alternative was written in terms of at least one, um, the alternative here is that at least one of these betas, at least one beta, is not equal to zero. So it doesn't necessarily mean that everything in the model is useful. Um, it just means that at least one of the variables in the model is useful. So at least one of them is actually affecting your predictions. So this output that is here, this is coming from jump, and specifically it would be coming from analyze fit model. Right? We have to use fit model in cases like this where we have more than one explanatory variable. Um, and this includes the analysis of variance table, which has a test statistic in it. So this F ratio here, this is our test statistic. Um, and it's a test statistic that we've never actually seen, um, but knowing what you know about test statistics, you might guess that a large F statistic means that we have strong evidence against the null hypothesis. So I'm not going to go through exactly how this is calculated, um, but for now you can just imagine that it works very similarly to like a Z or a T or a chi-squared test. It's a way of measuring your strength of evidence with a larger F indicating stronger evidence. But is this large enough? 32.7135, is that large enough to convince us that at least one of the variables is useful? To answer that, you need some kind of distribution to compare it to. So you have an F distribution, and this is showing you the values of F that you would expect to get if the null hypothesis were actually true. If none of the variables were useful, um, these are the F statistics that we would expect to get. A lot of them kind of here between 0 and 1, and then some of them that were bigger. So looking at this distribution, it looks like it goes from like 0 up to 6 is pretty much the max. So an F ratio of 32.7 is very large. So in this case, what we're seeing from this distribution is that this F statistic would actually be extremely unlikely to occur if the null hypothesis were true, right? It's like off the chart on that sampling distribution. It would be extremely unlikely. And so if it's extremely unlikely, then that's saying that we would have a small p-value. Right, because the p-value measures how likely it is to get a statistic like this if the null were actually true. So with a really small p-value, that means that we have very strong evidence against the null hypothesis. Right, in this case, very strong evidence that the overall model is useful. So remember, all this is actually telling us is that at least one variable in the model is useful. That's not immediately um, super helpful because you don't know which of these variables is actually useful for making predictions. So that's where t-tests and t-intervals come in. Um, we're going to use those to analyze the individual variables. So this is more output from analyze fit model. This parameter estimates table looks very similar to what we've done in simple regression, um, except notice that we have multiple slopes here. Right, because we have three different predictors, and so we have three different slope values. Um, we also have some information in this table. So standard error, obviously, that's the standard error. Um, the t-ratio, that's our t-statistic. 
And then here where it says probability greater than t, um, this is our two-sided p-value for each one. So when we state our hypotheses, we're doing it for an individual slope. So I'm just going to put beta i just to indicate that it could be beta 1, 2, or 3, whichever one we were testing for at the moment. And the null hypothesis would be um, that beta is equal to 0. The alternative, usually we do a two-sided alternative here, so that would be that beta is not equal to 0. And we're using the same formulas that you've seen before for the t statistic and for the confidence interval. So let's start with budget. We'll go through this one kind of in detail. Um, so first of all, how do they get that t statistic? So remember, the t statistic is the slope minus the null hypothesis value, which is 0, divided by the standard error. So if we take the slope 0 0.2362, if I'm rounding to four decimal places, um, and then divide it by the standard error, 0.1371, um, that's where we get that t-statistic of 1.72. And then when we're comparing it to a t-distribution, we have to know how many degrees of freedom we have. So we actually have a new formula here for the degrees of freedom. So when we talked about simple linear regression, we said that the degrees of freedom was n minus 2, right? Because you have 1 for the um, intercept and 1 for the slope, and so n minus 2 comes from there. But now we have more than one slope. So now we're going to do n minus 1 for the intercept, and then minus however many predictors you have. So you could have more than one slope here. Um, like in this example, we have a sample size of 43, minus 1 for the intercept, minus 3, because we have budget, opening, and theaters, those are our three predictors, is 39 degrees of freedom. If we want, we could use the distribution calculator um, to show where this p-value comes from. So it's quantitative data, so we're going to use the t-distribution. And we calculated that we had 39 degrees of freedom. We'll put in our test statistic, t equals 1.72 is what we got from jump. And we want this to be a two-sided test, so we're going to pick this last probability option and change value 1 to a negative number. And we get a p-value of 0 0.09. It comes out just a little bit different from the output just because of rounding. Okay, so our p-value from the output, we'll just stick with that one, um, was 0 0.0928. So depending on what our alpha level is, I should have specified that. Let's say use alpha is 0.05. Um, if we had a 0.05 significance level, this p-value is larger than that. Um, so this would be telling us that budget is not a significant predictor. Right? Our p-value is too large here. So it is not a significant predictor of our response variable, which in this case is revenue, revenue for these movies. Uh, but this is multiple regressions. You always have to add this tag after controlling for the other variables in the model. So in this case, the other variables in the model are opening and theaters. And you could have also said holding those variables constant or adjusting for those variables or something like that. We can also come up with a 95% confidence interval for this slope. So I'm just going to use the basic format of a confidence interval. Um, I'm going to start off with the statistic, which in this case is a slope. So 0.2362 was the slope for budget, plus or minus a T star value. So for T star, I need to go back to the distribution calculator. Still 39 degrees of freedom, but this time I'm doing input probability and central probability, and I'm going to put in for 95% confidence, 0.95, and this number that comes out is my T star, 2.0227. So T star is 2.0227, and I plug in my standard error, so I had 0.1371 here, and if I put all that together, I get a confidence interval that goes from negative 0.0411 up to 0 0.5135. So it's not really surprising here that this um, confidence interval includes zero, right? It could be positive, it could be negative, it could have no effect at all, and that's consistent with our decision from the p-value, right? Having a larger p-value said that this was not a significant predictor. In other words, it could just be by random chance that we got this slope, 
um, when in reality there is no relationship after controlling for these other variables. So I'm not going to go through all the details for um, the other ones, but if we look at opening, um, that one definitely has a small p-value. So that means that for this one, it is a significant predictor. Um, again, we mean significant predictor after controlling for budget and theaters, the other variables in the model. So if we were to calculate the confidence interval for that one, the confidence interval um, would not include zero. Right, because we know that it does have an impact. It's not reasonable um, to think that the slope is actually zero for this one. Um, whereas theaters, that one actually has an even larger p-value than budget. Um, so that one is not a significant predictor, at least not significant after controlling for the other variables in the model. And so if we calculated a confidence interval for that one, the confidence interval there would include zero. So we talked about two different types of hypothesis tests. You start off with an f-test for the overall model, and then if that one is significant, then you follow up with t-tests to figure out which variables are the useful ones.